Hey everyone, I'm the Canadian Lad, and Marvel just released the second and last official trailer of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Now, I've watched the trailer at point two five speed and found some amazing hidden details in this 2 minutes and 19 seconds trailer. Now, having the luxury of getting some inside information from Marvel, I can tell you unlike Phase 4, this movie will deliver. Especially Jonathan Majors. His big physique in such a gorgeous outfit is not only gonna catch your eye, but his performance is gonna be one to remember. But for this video, I'll only stick to easter eggs and hidden details details that I found in the trailer. I won't dive too much into spoilery stuff. But first, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is what happens if you crossed a blockbuster movie with a AAA game and then squeezed into a mobile phone that's also available on PC. Raid once again whipped up something special for all players, a new legendary champion based off MMA and pro wrestling legend Ronda Rousey. Besides taking on dragons and ice columns with her bare fists, Ronda's backstory is inspired from a real-life background. Born to a minor Bannerlord house, Ronda became became a formidable warrior training with her seven brothers. Her fighting potential was made clear during a tournament where she barehandedly took on four knights at once and quickly grew to local fame, eventually making her way to Arena City of Balazar, kicking butt until she became queen of the arena. Get Wanda for free right now by logging into Raid for seven days between now and February 28th. Use the code Raid Ronda to get a bunch of freebies to level up your Ronda. And to kick off 2023, there's a fresh Raid update including a new season of the Forge Pass, the Plarium Points program where can earn in-game goodies including a legendary champion and more. And for Raid's 4th anniversary later this year, Raid is launching the new Titan event. This new type of event lasts several weeks and will see you earning anniversary points and truly amazing rewards by competing in special themed events. On top of that, new players use my link or scan the QR code and get a free starter pack with this cool in-game loot. You will find your rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days only. You're an interesting man. Scott Lang. You're an Avenger. You have a daughter. But you've lost a lot of time. Like me. We can help each other with that. This trailer opens with voiceover from Kang the Conqueror, while the first trailer opens with Scott's own voiceover. I used to ask myself a lot of questions. You're an interesting man, Scott Lang. This immediately establishes the drastic changes between the two trailers in terms of tone and emotion. One is from Scott Lang's perspective, and this one is entirely from Kang's perspective. And if you let me stretch this point a little bit more, notice in the first trailer, Scott appeared all happy and relaxed. But in this one, that same footage now gives a different vibe altogether, just because of a different voiceover. Meaning, with this second trailer, we're now able to read between the lines a little bit more. Scott, even though appears all normal and happy to the general public, but deep down, something is killing him, and it is evident through his expression in the second trailer. Then we see Scott and Hope attending a fancy gala event, and as I said in my previous breakdown, this event is for a general science award, which means Hope is probably the one who got invited and Scott is her plus one. Then we see Scott getting a phone call from his daughter Cassie, who after Avengers Endgame is now a full-grown teenager. But notice he still uses the same old picture of Cassie when she was just a kid, implying Scott, despite having fame and success in his life now, still misses seeing his daughter grow growing up in front of him. Scott still didn't get over the fact that he missed 5 years of his daughter's life, and I think Kang might just use this weakness to use Scott for his own gain, and Scott might get manipulated for this reason as well, as he desperately wants to lead a normal life with his daughter. And I love how this photo is from Ant-Man 1, where Scott gave a very ugly gift to Cassie. He's so Then we see Cassie getting released from a jail cell, and this tells me she might have winded up becoming some sort of a con artist just like her father. And I don't think getting out for misdemeanors is that difficult for her, considering her stepdad is literally a cop. But the important detail here is that she's following the same footsteps as her father. Then we see some extended shot from the same scene from trailer 1 where this blue orb sucks everything inward. This happens when Cassie was showing off her new tech to the family, and something will definitely go wrong here. And just like we've seen in the first trailer, Scott Lang keeps shrinking by the second as it gets sucked by the quantum realm. On to the next clip. Who are you? I'm the man who can give you the one thing you want. What's that? Time. I can rewrite existence and shatter timelines. 
You cannot trust him. I don't care who this guy is. I just lost so much. Then we see Scott and Kang talking to each other one on one, but this time we get some close up shots of Kang. You notice Kang the Conqueror has these scars on his face, which He Who Remains did not have, implying this version of Kang is a warrior. He goes on quests and conquers. And I absolutely love the idea of putting an artificial helmet over Jonathan Majors' face to make him blue, instead of painting him all blue. This way we get both Jonathan Majors, the incredible actor, and of course a comic accurate Kang the Conqueror. In fact, I'd argue that Kang looks more scary with just his blue eyes and Jonathan Majors' incredible expressions. And I like the little CGI detail here where the lights around his helmet dims off a few moments before he deactivates his helmet. Well, in the comics, artists used to draw a white border around Kang's helmet. So I guess that's why the VFX team added these extra lights around his helmet to make a clear contrast. As always, Marvel and its CGI details never fail to impress me. Then we get yet another close-up shot of Kang, and the background pretty much confirms he's inside the quantum realm. So my theory that I talked about in trailer 1 breakdown, most of this movie could actually take place inside the quantum realm. And Kang's home city, aka Chronopolis, is indeed also inside the quantum realm. Now, Chronopolis in the comics is a multiversal city ruled by Kang the Conqueror. It's a city beyond time and the center of Kang's conquest. Now, Kang talks about making a deal with Scott. He says he can grant Scott time if Scott does something for him in return. Now, Kang offering someone more time, that's not surprising. He literally has power over space and time. But what could potentially our Scott offer Kang that he can't get himself or his millions of armies? And that's where I have a theory. Perhaps Kang needs some help with the Quantum Realm, and only Scott can help him. Well, not only Scott, I think Janet Van Dyne and Hank Pym both can help Kang achieve his goal, but they won't, and they're not easy to manipulate. But Scott, on the other hand, would love nothing more than to get back the time he missed with his daughter. So Kang might take advantage of this and use Scott for his own personal benefit. Then we see Kang walking in Chronopolis, and notice there are some very big wormholes throughout the city. These are basically portals that someone has to use in order to come here. And if you remember, back in Endgame, the Avengers used similar wormholes to go back in time. Then we see Scott literally getting split into two. Now I think this is the Quantum Nexus, the center of all time and space, where Scott will meet his multiversal variants. If you take a closer look, you'll notice they're both conscious and are aware of each other's presence. So yes, they're real, which only means we're gonna see the Quantum Nexus in the film. Then comes one of the biggest reveals of the trailer, MODOK, and a very comic accurate MODOK. Now MODOK is a villain I really thought could never properly be adapted to screen, yet here he is, done to perfection while still maintaining the seriousness. However, the most comic accurate design isn't the biggest reveal, it's the floating head, which is none other than Corey Stoll's Darren Cross. Yes, the very same one who supposedly died at the end of Ant-Man 1 where he got sucked into the quantum realm, but seems like he didn't die after all. But getting morphed into the quantum realm did however disfigure his whole body, therefore this goofy size and shape. But it's also entirely possible that this Darren Cross is a very and not the same one who Scott went up against in Ant-Man 1. Now one attention to detail that I loved and would like to show you lads is that because MODOK is a floating villain in the comics, notice his tiny legs don't move when he's walking. He just simply floats and hovers. Now if I just rewind back a couple of seconds, notice they all walk through a portal made out of a cloud-like thingy. So perhaps this is some place outside the Chronopolis and Kang has essentially brought Scott here to show him something. Let's roll the next clip. He can give us a second chance. Let me make this easy for you. You will bring me what I need. Or everything you call a life will end. Here we see Ant-Man falling towards the surface, but the surroundings look like beings that are alive. Now judging by the design and pattern here, this looks like the place Kang was showing Scott in the previous scene. So maybe whatever Kang needs is inside here, and that's why Ant-Man is going towards it. We then see Hank, Janet, and Hope surfing through a giant stingray. And then comes this epic shot where millions of Ant-Man variants make up a ladder for our Ant-Man to climb up and reach where he needs to go. This is exactly how ants behave in real life 
and I was smiling ear to ear when I saw them doing this in live action. Scott Lang will be more ant man in this film than ever before. And I like how the background visually resembles a group of ants, but when we see them up close, it's all Ant-Man variants. We then see a shot of Kang from behind, as he's looking towards Carnopolis. But notice there are debris all over the floor, and even this ring-shaped throne is damaged. And if I zoom in and slow down the playback, notice Kang's spaceships are getting attacked and destroyed, meaning a fight will definitely take place here. And then of course the title card says, witness the beginning of a new dynasty, which is a direct reference to Avengers Kang Dynasty, implying this movie will indeed plant the seeds for Avengers 5 and will be as crucial to the remainder of the MCU as Captain America Civil War was. On to the next clip. You may not want her to watch this. We had a deal. You could win. Here we see Scott and Cassie both running together. But if I put this scene side by side with the previous trailer, notice how many changes they've made in the second trailer. In the first one, we didn't really know who's shooting at them, but in this one, we do. And there were no Quantum Realm locals in this scene, but now they've added some civilians. Not only that, they have changed the whole background behind them and made it much more realistic. Then we see Cassie's held hostage by Kang's henchmen. And then we see this scene where Scott looks at multiple variants of himself and one literally comes out of him. But notice the one that just emerged from Scott himself immediately activates his helmet. And if you notice in the next shot, a new variant comes out of Scott again and puts on his helmet. And by going frame by frame multiple times for one hour straight, I have come to the conclusion that this was a deliberate choice from the VFX team. All variants of Scott Lang have their helmets on except for Scott himself. This has been done to help the audience distinguish between our Scott Lang and all the variants. The VFX team did something similar in Avengers Endgame as well, where they put Cap's helmet back on so we know which Steve is which at all times. But now the question is, why are so many Ant-Man variants appearing here literally from one another? And my theory is, each decision that Scott makes here creates a branch in reality and gives birth to a new timeline. And because this is the quantum nexus, that's why we're able to visually see them. But notice how Scott's only focus is on this giant version, and he screams as soon as this giant variant rips himself apart. Let me know what you lads think about this though. Why is Scott only focused on this giant variant and not anyone else? Then we see Cassie making a jump wearing her full costume. We see an explosion, but not sure what caused it exactly. But notice it has a similar background as the one where Scott and Cassie were running together. Cut to Modoc who is in his full armor and boy does it look good, eh? Notice he also has vital signs in the middle of his body, indicating he's half human and half robot. And the fact that Modoc looks so good in this film, I really hope he's not gonna die in it. He's a great villain and the longer he stays alive, the more chaos. Kang is a clear villain at all times, but for Modoc who's so clever and decisive, you will never see him coming. He could be your friend and try to kill you at the same time. Then we see a massive hand-to-hand -hand combat between Kang and Scott. Kang is even bleeding from his right arm, as his right hand armor is completely gone. I like how Kang's face and his whole body are perfectly intact, but it's only his right arm that took hit. And notice when he kicks, he aims it towards Scott's helmet. And when he throws a punch, he again aims on Scott's face. He really knows where to hit and cause the most damage. This already tells me that the action choreography in this film is gonna be epic. Now notice just before Kang kicks Scott's face, the debris on the floor looks very similar to what we've seen in the trailer previously. Meaning, this is before the fight and this is after the fight. Because here, his right hand armor is still perfect. And remember I told you, Kang's ships were getting ambushed in the background. Well, if you look closely through Scott's lenses, we can see a spaceship exploding in the scene as well. So yes, these are all different shots from the same scene. Cut to the next clip. I don't have to win. We both just have to lose. Scott gets rid of his helmet as it's totally destroyed because of Kang's kick. This also goes to show just how powerful Kang is even without any weapon. And then Scott says one of the most iconic lines in the MCU, I don't have to win, we just both have to lose. But notice when he says it, we can actually see a few cracks in reality, just like we've seen in the first trailer. Meaning, Hope will be here as well and might end up saving Scott from Kang. Or they might get trapped here, I don't know. 
And also notice as soon as Scott said we just both have to lose, all hell breaks loose in the trailer. The letter that all the variants had made up for him starts falling apart and he starts drowning in the midst of his own variants. And the last shot of the trailer shows Kang in his full armor, blasting a blue energy. But notice there's a very interesting hidden detail here. As Kang gets angry and generates power to blast his enemy, even the scars on his face light up just like his helmet. Well, I initially thought that's probably just a reflection of this blue energy, but if I go back a few frames, to notice even then his scars appear all blue. And I love the animation on his suit when he charges up to shoot a blast from his bare hands. I love Jonathan Majors as an actor, and the fact that they managed to make him look even cooler, I just can't wait for this movie to come out now. These are pretty much all the hidden details and easter eggs I've managed to find in this brand new trailer. Let me know if I missed any in the comment section below, and comment your favorite detail from this video as well. Now as I told you in my previous video, I'm aiming to reach 2 million subscribers by 24th of April. So please Please subscribe to my channel if you like my videos and of course please give me a thumbs up that helps me a lot. I'll be in the comment section for the next 30 minutes so let's talk and discuss this video. Till then I'll see you lads in the next one.